Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for participating in our webinar, Empowering Pediatric Providers to Support Breastfeeding. My name is Emily Scott, and I am a general pediatrician and the medical director of the IU Health Methodist Newborn Nursery. I also serve as co-chair of the Indiana AAP's Infant Mortality Committee. I am partnering with Indiana Perinatal Network, the ISDH, Indiana Rural Health Association, and the Indiana Breastfeeding Coalition to present this important material to you. Our objectives today will be to understand the importance of breastfeeding for the baby, the mother, and society, review evidence-based policies and practices for supporting breastfeeding, review the management of common breastfeeding problems, and learn how to send up, set up a breastfeeding-friendly medical practice and how to utilize community support. I would like to start off our presentation with this quote from Todd Woolen, a pediatrician who wrote an article entitled, Breastfeeding, So Easy Even a Doctor Can Support It. He writes, imagine if you will, a super medicine. It's stable and palatable. It reduces and prevents multiple diseases. It reduces and prevents deaths. One dose treats two patients simultaneously. It can even be manufactured safely and legally at home. It requires no insurance coverage, and it's free to anybody who needs it. When breastfeeding is looked at in this simple global context, it does make me want to work even harder to support all of our moms and babies. Exclusive breast milk feeding through six months of life is the recommendation of the World Health Organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and the Department of Health and Human Services, among other organizations. After six months, it is recommended that mothers continue to breastfeed their infants through either one year per the AAP or two years per the World Health Organization or longer as mutually desired by the mom and the baby. The US government made breastfeeding a priority by setting strong standards in their Healthy People 2020 goals. While it would be wonderful if every breast baby received breast milk for the AAP recommendations, 100% is not a realistic goal until our infant feeding culture changes dramatically in America. By 2020, the goal is to have 81.9% of babies ever been breastfed. For 2014 CDC data, we are actually not too far off of this goal at 79% currently. However, where we fall short is with moms continuing to, continuing to breastfeed their infants per the AAP recommendations, particularly exclusively for six months and at all through 12 months. In Indiana, we fall even sh farther short of the 2020 goals, particularly in moms continuing to breastfeed their babies through six and 12 months of age. We have only 21% of moms and babies meeting the goal of breastfeeding through 12 months. What I would also like to draw your attention to is the percentage of breastfed newborns receiving formula before two days of life. It is an astounding 17%. This is where we as medical providers can do a lot of work in promoting exclusive breastfeeding in our newborn nurseries. What is more important to individual patients, however, is what each mom's personal breastfeeding goals are. I ask each mom this question when I first meet with her in the hospital. This provides me the perfect introduction to educating moms on the importance of exclusive breastfeeding and discussing how we will support her in those efforts. However, a recent study in 2013 showed that 60% of moms stop breastfeeding before meeting their own personal breastfeeding goals. The reasons cited by moms in the study are problems latching, their baby not seeming satisfied and concerns about their own milk supply, sore and cracked nipples or painful latching, mom's concerns about medications that they've been started on, either mom or baby becoming ill, or a healthcare provider becoming concerned about the baby's weight gain. These are important reasons for us to keep in mind so that we can target moms' specific concerns and provide them education and encouragement to keep breastfeeding their babies. The benefits of breastfeeding a baby have been well established. 
When discussing this with families, I first discuss the short-term benefits, which are mainly a greatly decreased risk of many common infectious diseases of infancy. I tell parents that not only are their babies less likely to become sick and get admitted to the hospital, but if they do happen to catch a respiratory or gastrointestinal bug, they will often get better much quicker than a formula-fed baby. Long-term benefits we discuss include a decreased risk of diabetes, asthma and allergies, chronic GI conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease and celiac disease, and childhood leukemia. However, perhaps most importantly, given the epidemic in our country, there is a decreased risk of becoming overweight and obese and the consequences thereafter if babies are breastfed. In fact, any breastfeeding at all will decrease a baby's risk of obesity in the future by 24%. Therefore, any program to address obesity prevention in our country must start with supporting breastfeeding in the infancy period. I think it's also important to stress to parents that the risk of sudden infant death syndrome in their baby is decreased 73% if the baby is breastfed. Likewise for moms, I often break benefits of breastfeeding into immediate and long-term benefits. Immediate benefits increase, include a decreased risk of postpartum hemorrhage and decreased postpartum depression, improved bonding with their baby and decreased maternal stress, and typically a faster return to their pre-pregnancy weight. Long-term benefits are significant and include a reduction in metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease, a decreased risk of premenopausal breast cancer and ovarian cancer, and a reduced risk of type 2 diabetes in moms who did not have gestational diabetes. There's also um, evidence that breastfeeding will create a prolonged interpregnancy interval, which has important benefits for both infant and, mort and maternal mortality. From a societal perspective, breastfeeding has extensive cost savings to both the individual and the family and our country. Let's face it, formula is expensive, and the cost to our environment of producing and transporting formula can't be ignored. In a 2007 AHRQ report, they estimated cost savings of $13 billion a year in pediatric health care costs if 90% of moms in our country exclusively breastfed their babies for six months. This did not include any savings from um, preventing adult health diseases and obesity, nor did it include any savings from parental absenteeism. The battle we constantly fight in our nursery is what is the harm of just one bottle of formula? It's the middle of the night, mom is exhausted, baby's fussy, and the nurse is at her wit's end trying to keep this mom breastfeeding. So they ask, is one bottle really going to change anything in the long run? Well, there is evidence that the introduction of a formula bottle in the hospital is the most significant predictor of breastfeeding duration um, that we have. We also know that the introduction of the first bottle makes it even less likely that mom will return to exclusive breastfeeding in the future. In addition, there's emerging evidence that the introduction of formula can actually dramatically change the baby's gut microbiome. Human milk is specifically made for baby's belly and works with the mucosal cells and bacteria to decrease disease risk, modulate pro-inflammatory mediators to prevent propagation of inflammation in the GI tract and beyond, and act as pre and probiotics to support the growth of good bacteria. Any formula, even if limited, will change a baby's gut to resemble that of a formula-fed infant and throw off this delicate balance. In addition, as little as 40 mLs of formula can increase the baby's risk for milk allergy. Now that we've reviewed the importance of breastfeeding, let's discuss how we can work as providers to best promote it. Breastfeeding promotion must begin prenatally. So if you are a family medicine provider who sees mom and baby, or you're a pediatrician who has prenatal meet and greets, this is the perfect opportunity to provide mom with useful information on the benefits and management of breastfeeding. We need to make sure that our moms are well informed about their infant feeding decision. When we talk about breast versus formula feeding, it is important that we, as healthcare providers, don't make the option seem equivocal, like you can do one or the other and the outcomes are essentially the same. Moms need to be informed that breastfeeding is an important health decision for their baby and themselves, 
it's not just about which is perceived to fit better into their lifestyle or be easier. We know that OB provider encouragement matters a lot to our moms. So encourage your local OB providers and family medicine doctors to continue recommending breastfeeding to their patients. It's important to provide information about breastfeeding and discuss it throughout the pregnancy, not just at the first or last prenatal visit. The more exposure moms have to the benefits of breastfeeding, the better. You can even util utilize motivational interviewing techniques, just like we do when we're trying to get our patients to quit smoking. You can ask mom what they think they will like about their feeding choice, and then ask what they think the downsides will be. You can provide them with evidence-based information based on their um, discussion and then get their reactions to that. You also want to encourage moms and their families to attend breastfeeding classes. If mom seems reluctant or is unable to get transportation, you can get creative. I recently had a wonderful experience with a very young, first-time mom who looked like an absolute pro breastfeeding her one-day-old newborn. When I asked her how she learned such great technique and got so confident, she confided that she'd never attended a breastfeeding class, but had watched a lot of YouTube videos on breastfeeding a newborn and getting a good latch. The OB period is also important in helping us identify moms who have a potential for breastfeeding problems. OB providers can identify mom with, con with concerning breast anatomy, particularly tubular or widely spaced breasts, or moms who've had no breast changes during their pregnancy. It is also important to know whether moms have had a prior breast surgery, particularly a history of reduction, as they are often at higher risk for insufficient milk supply. By educating these moms and even having them see a lactation specialist before delivery for counseling and plan development, we may be able to preserve some breastfeeding in this population. There are very few maternal medical problems that are a contraindication to breastfeeding. If mom has untreated active TB, she should not breastfeed her baby at the breast until her disease is under control, typically until she's been on treatment for about two weeks. She can pump her breast milk during that time. HIV is a contraindication to breastfeeding in the developed world, and active herpetic lesions of the breast are a contraindication until they are cleared. Moms are free to breastfeed if they're hepatitis B positive as long as their baby has received the hepatitis B vaccine and the immunoglobulin. Similarly, hepatitis C is not considered a contraindication of breastfeeding, although it's important to know that um, cracked and bleeding nipples may pose an increased risk of transmission to the baby. CMV is not a contraindication to breastfeeding a term infant, and moms can breastfeed an infant while they have breast cancer until they are receiving chemotherapy. In my practice, I have found that moms are sometimes told that they can't breastfeed their baby if they are on certain medications. In reality, there are very few medications that are absolute contraindications to breastfeeding. If you are caring for a mom who is on a medication that you are not familiar with, or if she's on a lot of different medications, there are multiple reliable resources you can utilize. Thomas Hale's Medications and Mother's Milk is updated frequently and is a great resource. If you have any questions about his recommendations, you can also go to his website or call his Infant Risk Center based out of Texas. There you will get um, recommendations from a specialist in his center about the baby's risk. Most of the time, I utilize the LactMed website or app from the National Institutes of Health. It is free and very easy to use. LactMed will tell you the safety of each medication mom is on, if there's not currently good evidence to indicate whether or not there is a risk, they will often recommend supporting breastfeeding, but will provide the pediatric provider with a list of symptoms to watch for. The Organization of Teratology Information Specialist also has great information about some of the more, red, more rare medications that mom may be on. I would encourage you to utilize these resources over the physician's drug reference, or package inserts, which often contain confusing or nebulous information. Maternal substance use is always a tricky subject to handle. Overall, alcohol in moderation is compatible with breastfeeding. Alcohol tends to equilibrate quickly between mom's blood and breast milk, 
And so the best advice is to limit to one drink a day and wait about two hours after consumption to breastfeed the baby. Cigarette smoking is compatible with breastfeeding as well, but mom should be continually encouraged to um, stop smoking or to limit as much as possible. Cigarette smoking while breastfeeding has been shown to negate the benefit breastfeeding has on SIDS prevention and raises a breastfed infant SIDS risk to that of a formula-fed baby. Both the AAP and the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine strongly discourage any breastfeeding with illicit drug use, particularly any use in the last 30 to 90 days prior to delivery. This recommendation also includes marijuana. If moms are in recovery from opiate abuse and on methadone or buprenorphine in a treatment program, they should be encouraged to breastfeed as this may have significant benefits in decreasing a baby's hospitalization length for neonatal abstinence syndrome. We are now gonna discuss how to support breastfeeding in the hospital setting during the immediate postpartum period. The Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative is a worldwide program launched by the World Health Organization and UNICEF in 1991 as a global effort to implement practices that protect, promote, and support breastfeeding. It is an evidence-based program that has been shown to improve breastfeeding rates in this population. Nine hospitals in Indiana have received baby friendly designation, which means they have successfully implemented the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding and abide by the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, meaning that they do not advertise formula or send families home with a formula gift pack at the time of discharge. Even if you do not work in a baby friendly hospital, you can still implement the 10 steps to successful breastfeeding to improve your hospital's breastfeeding rates. The 10 steps to successful breastfeeding include having a written policy that is routinely communicated, training all healthcare staff and skills necessary to implement the policy, informing all pregnant women about the benefits and management of breastfeeding, helping mothers initiate breastfeeding by placing babies skin to skin immediately after birth, showing moms how to breastfeed and how to maintain lactation if they're, maintain lactation if they're separated from their baby giving a newborn infant no food or drink other than breast milk unless medically indicated, practicing rooming in, which allows moms and babies to remain together 24 hours a day, encouraging breastfeeding on demand, giving no artificial teats or pacifiers to a breastfed infant, and fostering the establishment of breastfeeding support groups and referring mothers to them upon discharge from the hospital. Before moms arrive at the hospital to deliver, it is important that they have good expectations on how breastfeeding will be supported in the hospital. As mentioned, ideal practice is to have baby placed skin to skin immediately at birth if stable, practice rooming in with on-demand feeding and avoiding all pacifiers and formula. It is important that weight loss is anticipated and normalized and that moms understand how the pediatric provider will know that their baby is getting enough specifically by evaluating the frequency and duration of feeds and watching the baby's voids and stools. Benefits of early skin-to-skin -skin contact are well-researched and identified and include an increased likelihood of a, of a successful first breastfeed, a reduction in time to the first effective breastfeed, and increased breastfeeding rates at discharge four and six months of life. The next three benefits are crucial as they decrease the likelihood that mom and baby will have to be separated or the baby will have to go to the NICU and include better thermoregulation for baby, improved cardiopulmonary stability in the late preterm infant, and improved blood glucose scores. Moms also report reduced pain from engorgement and less anxiety on postpartum day number three. Skin to skin is very easy to achieve after the normal vaginal birth, as long as all hospital staff have a good respect for the critical importance of this time for both mom and baby. However, skin to skin after a C-section is not done as routinely, but it's equally as important and can be just as easy to manage with good communication between the OB provider, anesthesiologist, and nursing staff. If your hospital is not currently offering this, I would encourage you to look into making this a possibility, particularly in your non-urgent scheduled C-sections. 
All medical staff should ideally communicate consistent and realistic expectations of breastfeeding a newborn. The biggest reason that families ask for supplementation is that they are worried their baby isn't getting enough volume. Moms will report, I asked for a bottle last night because I just don't have any milk yet. It is important to discuss the importance of colostrum and that it is normal for the volumes to be small. In fact, that is the way nature intended it to be. We need to emphasize the supply and demand concept and importance of rooming in 24-7 so that mom can recognize her baby's feeding cues and feed the baby on demand. Parents also need to be advised that it's completely normal for their term baby to be very sleepy on the first day of life and not breastfeed very well, but then the baby will start to cluster feed, mostly at night. This behavior doesn't mean the baby is not getting enough, but rather is the baby's way of working with the mom's body to help her milk transition. It is normal. Everyone, doctors, nurses, and lactation specialists have to work together to help moms trust their own bodies. I love this table from the AAP because it does show the natural progression of breast milk volume and voids and stools that we expect to see and can help educate hospital staff about what truly is normal. For families, visual aids such as this picture and belly balls illustrating the size of a newborn stomach can help reassure them that their baby doesn't need, need much milk to get full. These aids can also be very valuable in educating parents, grandparents, and even our hospital staff. One of the biggest questions I get asked by my pediatric residents is when would a baby actually need supplementation during the newborn period? According to the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine's clinical policy statement on supplementation, these are the infant medical reasons for supplementation. They include hypoglycemia, unresponsive to appropriate frequent breastfeeding, significant dehydration, delayed lactogenesis 2 with weight loss of 8 to 10 percent at day 5, delayed bowel movements or continued meconium stools at day 5, poor milk transfer, poor milk transfer or hyperbilirubinemia associated with starvation. Maternal indications for supplementation include delayed lactogenesis 2 caused by retained placenta, Sheehan syndrome, or primary glandular insufficiency, breast pathology or prior breast surgery resulting in poor milk production, and intolerable pain during feeding despite interventions. The hardest fear to combat for newborn providers is that of the 10% weight loss. It is important for pediatric providers to realize that many normal, healthy babies will lose 10% or slightly more of their birth weight in the first two to four days after birth, and for providers to learn how to distinguish ex excessive weight loss from dehydration. I have never seen a baby who is dehydrated when their only clinical symptom is weight loss. Our truly dehydrated babies will also have decreased voids, hyperbilirubinemia, or other concerning findings on physical exam. For years, I saw babies, particularly after C-section births, who were breastfeeding well, weighting and stooling normally with a low-risk billy, but who would be down about 11% or so at the time of discharge. As I too had learned the 10% rule during my training, I was never sure what to do with these babies. It felt wrong to supplement them, but they made me nervous. Then in January of 2015, this fantastic paper came out in pediatrics. The authors looked at 161,000 newborns born in Northern California's Kaiser Permanente system and watched what their weight did, weight, weights did over their hospital stay. Luckily, this was done in California where they have a great exclusive breastfeeding rate. What they discovered is that a significant proportion of newborns will lose weight up to 10 to 12% following birth and they developed these weight loss nomograms that varied considerably based on the mode of delivery. Based on this paper, a new website was developed that allows newborn providers to plot a baby's weight loss on a nomogram. This is available for free at newbornweight.org. Here I've entered in a baby's information. This was a term C-section baby who was breastfeeding well per lactation and mom, who had a weight loss of about 10% at 50 hours of life with normal void stools and billy. 
When this baby is graphed, you can see that despite being at about 10% weight loss, the baby is actually between the 75th and 90th percentile. So if all other variables look good as they did, this should not be a cause for concern in and of itself. Some pediatricians and newborn providers are also supplementing with formula too early for hypoglycemia. While we used to supplement any baby with a blood sugar less than 40, these new guidelines from the AAP in 2011 recommended using 25 as a threshold for asymptomatic babies in the first four hours of life and 35 as a threshold for supplementation for asymptomatic babies at four to 24 hours of life. Using these new physiologically normal lows has prevented a great deal of supplementation in our patient population in the hospital. The management of the late preterm infant remains a challenge, especially as more and more of these 35 to 36 week infants are coming to the well newborn nursery with the expectation of getting discharged home with their moms in 48 hours. It is important to keep in mind that these babies may not be able to transfer enough breast milk effectively from breastfeeding at the breast alone. Poor milk transfer sets them up for excessive weight loss, hypoglycemia, and jaundice, which will then perpetuate any feeding issues. These babies all need close lactation support. It is often helpful to initiate a nipple shield to help with milk transfer, and to have moms start pumping early to keep their breasts adequately stimulated. These babies may need short-term supplementation with breast milk or even a 22 kcal preterm formula and will definitely need frequent weight checks in the outpatient setting by their pediatrician. If supplementation is necessary, we want to do our best to preserve exclusivity in the long run. Mom should still put the baby to breast with each feed. If we can, we like to use mom's own breast milk first if this baby needs supplementation. If we have a baby that we are anticipating may need that, such as a late preterm baby or a baby at risk for withdrawal from neonatal abstinence syndrome, we may ask that the mom start pumping early to get her own supply in sooner and build up stores for the baby. If mom's own milk is not available for supplementation, you can use donor breast milk from a certified human milk bank in certain situations. A good example that we use this for is a baby who needs supplementation for hypoglycemia on day of life number zero, but whose mom is committed to exclusive breastfeeding. If using donor milk, moms must pump during this period to hasten their own supply so that we can transition to mom's own milk as soon as possible. We use very small physiologic volumes, like 10 to 15 mLs, so that the baby continues to want to breastfeed every two to three hours. We only use supplementation with a very clear endpoint in mind, and we provide mom with a plan to transition the baby back to exclusive breastfeeding. Ideally, our breastfed baby should see their pediatrician within about two to three days of their hospital discharge. Sooner if they are discharged home earlier than 48 hours, or a jaundiced or preterm. This can help identify early problems with breastfeeding like excessive weight loss or jaundice, and it also provides a great opportunity for pediatric providers to continue to encourage moms to breastfeed and reinforce their good practices. In fact, appropriate early follow-up of newborns has been shown to decrease hospital readmissions in a recent study. We will now move on to discussing outpatient management of the breastfed infant. Oftentimes, breastfeeding will progress naturally without any complications, and you just need to stand back and watch. You will need to make sure that your patient is on vitamin D supplementation, as the recommended 400 international units of vitamin D is not available in breast milk alone. You will also want to make sure your patients are being plotted on the appropriate growth curves, utilizing the World Health Organization growth standards that were adopted in 2010 by the CDC and the AAP as a standardized growth curves for children through the first two years of life. These growth curves offer a multinational and multicultural perspective of children who are healthy and optimally breastfed. One important topic to discuss with all of your families, breastfeeding or not, is where baby is sleeping. The AAP recommends that mom and baby sleep in the same room, but not the same bed for the first six months of life. 
Some of our families, particularly our breastfeeding families, choose to co-bed their infants due to perceived increased bonding and ease of breastfeeding at night. It needs to be stressed to these families that the risk of SIDS, sudden unexpected infant death, and accidental suffocation and strangulation in bed is dramatically higher in co-bedding families, and that having a bassinet or pack and play right next to mom's bed, as pictured here, is the safest option and also very conducive to breastfeeding at night. The biggest reason for early cessation of breastfeeding is the lack of breast milk, and this is either a real or perceived issue for moms. Signs and symptoms of insufficient milk syndrome include the following, delayed or infrequent bowel movements, decreased urinary output, persistent jaundice, an inconsolable baby, a lethargic baby, or continued loss of over 8 to 10 percent of birth weight. If your patient does not meet any of these signs or symptoms, then sometimes all that is needed for mom is education and reassurance that she has plenty of breast milk for her newborn. It may be beneficial to offer these moms more frequent weight checks with your nurse so that she can see that her baby is growing appropriately. However, if your patient does meet some signs or symptoms of insufficient milk syndrome, then identifying the problem is key. There could be a maternal production problem. Primary lactation failure is rare, but does happen. These are often moms who have had abnormal breast anatomy or did not have breast changes during their pregnancy. If moms had complications with delivery, such as retained placenta or postpartum hemorrhage, then lactogenesis too may be delayed. Diabetes, obesity, and some medications, particularly pseudoephedrine, can also cause a problem. There also could be a problem with baby extracting milk from the breast. Late preterm infants or infants with neurologic conditions leading to hypertonia or hypotonia may be very inefficient at breastfeeding, leading mom to have decreased stimulation and consequently a decreased milk supply as well. In addition, babies with oral anomalies, such as a subtle cleft palate or ankyloglossia, can have extraction problems. In cases of insufficient milk syndrome, history is key. These babies also need a direct feeding observation done by yourself or someone who is comfortable in assessing the adequacy of a breastfeed. Pre and post feeding weights can be done on a scale calibrated to plus or minus two grams to assess milk transfer. These dyads will definitely benefit from an outpatient lactation visit to help maximize milk production and transfer. Moms need to express their milk every three hours and often need to be started pumping. If babies need supplementation, as little as one to two ounces after each breastfeed is often sufficient while breastfeeding and production issues are being addressed. Ankyloglossia is another problem encountered in this patient population. It is important to note that not all babies with ankyloglossia will have a problem breastfeeding. However, if you see a newborn with a tongue tie who is not thriving, or mom is reporting nipple trauma or pain, it is often fixed by a simple phrenotomy performed by an ENT. Moms often report immediate improvement in feeding after their phrenotomy is performed. Breastfeeding jaundice is one of the most common causes of readmission for newborns. When assessing a newborn for hyperbilirubinemia, it is important to use accurate and reliable bilirubin measurements. Transcutaneous bilies are great for screening in your office, but if you are considering readmission for phototherapy, it is important to have a serum bilirubin. The AAP guidelines should be followed when determining whether phototherapy needs to be initiated. Most babies can continue breastfeeding while receiving phototherapy, but the physician may want to limit the baby's time out from under the lights. If breastfeeds are being limited, then mom should be encouraged to pump frequently to produce express breast milk for her baby. All breastfed babies being readmitted for jaundice do need a lactation assessment to confirm that the baby is transferring milk effectively. Breast milk jaundice is an outpatient problem that rarely needs hospital readmission. In fact, it is normal for serum unconjugated bilirubin to remain elevated as long as 6 to 12 weeks in the thriving breastfed newborn. You do want to make sure you have had a normal newborn screen 
as galactosemia and hypothyroidism can present with persistent hyperbilirubinemia. UTI, pyloric stenosis, and low-grade hemolysis can also present with jaundice in the first few weeks of life as well, although a history and review of birth records should pick up these cases. At some point, a conjugated bilirubin should be checked to rule out GI pathology, particularly biliary atresia. However, if all signs point to breast milk jaundice, then breastfeeding should be encouraged while these babies are followed clinically. If the bili is persistently increasing or is significantly worrisome, then some infants do need a diagnostic challenge where breastfeeding is interrupted for 24 to 48 hours. If the hyperbilirubinemia is due to breast milk jaundice, then the bili will drop quickly. Mom should be encouraged to pump during the time of this challenge and resume breastfeeding once the diagnosis is confirmed. Growth spurts are common during the first several months of life. Mom will report that her baby is acting hungrier than usual and may not be satisfied with feeds. This leads many moms to worry that their supply is insufficient and can cause premature weaning. If possible, these growth spurts should be anticipated with families as they typically occur around two to three weeks, six weeks or three months, and are of very short duration. When the mom responds appropriately by increasing the frequency that she feeds the baby, her milk supply will increase with it. If on the other hand, she responds by adding formula, the baby may start taking more formula and decrease breastfeeding frequency, causing a continually decreasing breast milk production. Nursing strikes are another problem you may encounter in your office. These can occur at any time and typically manifest as an infant's refusal to nurse. They can be caused by separation, infant illness such as a cold, teething, or even simple things that change mom's scent to the baby, like new soaps, a new deodorant, a change in diet, or the return of mom's menses. Mom should be encouraged to feed their baby in a quiet, calm place with no distractions. Some babies will feed better when they are sleepy or awakening, and so that should be tried as well. Moms need to make sure they're maintaining their own milk supply by pumping if the baby's refusing to nurse. Skin to skin time should also be encouraged. Nursing strikes don't last forever, but definitely are something that you can get an outpatient lactation consultant to help with as well. Growth faltering occurs if you see a baby crossing two lines downward on their growth chart, or if the weight decreases to more than two standard deviations below the mean. If this is happening, then your baby should be assessed for their nutritional intake. You can, should do a careful assessment of mom's milk supply, baby's intake, feeding pattern, and use of complementary foods, and respond appropriately. The question of when to introduce solid foods to a breastfed baby is a good one. While most babies are developmentally ready to accept complementary foods before six months, there are definite benefits to delaying their introduction to six months. While there are benefits to breastfeeding for any duration, the PROBIT study documents reduction in GI tract disease and improved cognitive outcomes in infants exclusively breastfed for six months rather than three to four months. There are also benefits seen in the re further reduction of asthma, childhood leukemia, and otitis media with six months of exclusivity. The pediatric provider is going to see mom and baby on a much more frequent basis over the first year of the baby's life than mom's OB provider. In fact, most moms will not see their OBs until six weeks postpartum, and the baby will have had at least three outpatient pediatric visits by that point. Therefore, moms will often approach pediatricians with concerns about their own body and breastfeeding. Common complications to be aware of are candidal infections, engorgement, plugged milk ducts, mastitis, and postpartum depression. It is important to be aware of these issues and to give moms good guidance and referral, either back to their OBGYN or to other outpatient resources, such as a lactation specialist or counseling services. Finally, pediatric providers need to be prepared to help support mom's eventual return to work or school. This is often a time of great anxiety for new moms and sometimes will lead to premature weaning. 
It is important that moms are aware of laws supporting the expression of breast milk in the workplace. Moms should be aware of the business case for breastfeeding, which include lower medical costs and health insurance claims for breastfeeding employees and their infants, reduced turnover, lower absenteeism rates, improved productivity, and increased employee morale and loyalty to the company. Offices should provide time and a clean private place to express milk, and this does not include in the bathroom. If mom does not have a pump yet, she should be encouraged to call her insurance company, as most moms are able to obtain an electric breast pump through the Affordable Care Act at a reduced cost or even free. Mom should continue to pump every two to th or three to four hours at work and at home, they should maximize skin-to-skin -skin contact and breastfeeding at the breast. It's also important to review the rule of fives of handling express breast milk. The breast milk can be kept for five hours at room temperature, five days in the refrigerator, and five months in the freezer. We will now review how to set up your office as a breastfeeding friendly practice. It is important that all staff believe that breastfeeding is a normative form of nutrition for all babies. Ideally, there should be a room for mothers of patients and employees to breastfeed and pump. However, if that is not possible, moms should never be discouraged from breastfeeding in the waiting room or anywhere in your office. All formula marketing should be discouraged per a 2012 AAP resolution. Formula gift bags, in particular, should be removed from the office, as having these bags in your office sends a message that undermines the importance of breastfeeding. Giving moms formula to have on hand just in case is counterproductive and leads moms to question whether you think their supply will be enough. Breastfeeding should be encouraged at each visit, and moms should receive support and have their fears and challenges addressed appropriately. In addition, it is helpful for all staff to have some education in the importance of breastfeeding support. You could consider adding a lactation specialist to your office. Anyone can become a certified lactation counselor by taking a 40-hour course that is offered multiple times locally throughout the year. By tracking breastfeeding rates in your practice, you can get a sense of how well your office is doing in supporting and encouraging breastfeeding. You also want to make sure that your telephone triage service has good breastfeeding knowledge. And finally, it is key to know what resources are available in your community for extra support. When looking for good breastfeeding support in the community, I would encourage you to start with your local hospital's lactation center. They often will know the most reputable outpatient resources in your local area. Hospital-based or community-based breastfeeding support groups are a wonderful resource where moms can often get assessed by a lactation specialist and support from other new moms in the area. Peer counselors are also available through WIC and your local LHA lead group. For a full list of updated resources by county, please consult the Indiana Perinatals Network's website. There are multiple additional resources for physicians to reference to increase their breastfeeding comfort and knowledge. A great place to start is with the American Academy of Pediatrics. They have several online resources available through their website, in addition to the print copy of the book, The Breastfeeding Handbook for Physicians, which was recently released in a second edition. There are also other breastfeeding education programs for physicians listed here, many of which are free of charge. In 2011, Surgeon General Regina Benjamin issued the Surgeon General's call to action to support breastfeeding. In her remarks, she said, mothers rely on physicians for help and advice on how to feed their babies. Without help, many mothers see breastfeeding as a goal they cannot reach. Many mothers do not know the health benefits or the health risks to their babies and themselves when they do not breastfeed. This information is helpful for mothers so that they can decide how to feed their babies. Doctors in all clinical care settings can provide support to new moms and their babies. In conclusion, I would like to thank you for participating in this webinar for pediatric providers. If we all work together to increase breastfeeding in the state of Indiana, we will have a tremendous impact on the health of our infants and children as they grow. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact the staff at the Indiana Perinatal Network.
All right. Oops. Didn't mean to stop that. How do I stop it? <laughs> Will that work?